All set, Mayor. Okay, thank you, Ed. All right, good afternoon. The school committee proposed budget workshop and meeting of June 12, 2020 will now come to order. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place, this meeting of the Methuen School Committee is being conducted via remote participation. Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? Ryan DeZoglio. Present. Karen Halbauer. Present. Jessica McLeod. Present. Susan Nicholson. Present. Julian Santos. Present. Dana Zani Pesh. Present. And Mia Neal Perry. Present. And we also have in attendance, as always, Superintendent uh, Brandy Kwong. Uh, we also have Assistant Superintendent uh, Eric McGee. And we have Colleen McCarthy and Ed Lucier and Ian Goslin. Sorry, Ian almost forgot you. So, <laughs> all right. May, may I have a motion to accept the agenda? So moved. moved by Second. Member, seconded by Member DeZoglio. Any discussion? Seeing or hearing none, uh, Madam Secretary? Brian DeZoglio? Yes. Karen Halbauer? Yes. Jessica McLeod? Yes. Susan Nicholson? Yes. Lynn Santos? Yes. Dana Zani Pesh? Yes. And then Neil Perry? Yes. All right, and that brings us to the flag salute. Any volunteers before I, I volunteer myself? You're going to do it, Dodie? No, thank you. All right, I'll stand up and do it. I got it right here in my office. So join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Republic. The Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and liberty and justice for all. Good job. Member DeSantis, you're much faster than I am. All right, uh, so public participation was posted as individuals that would like to participate at this meeting may do so in writing before noontime Monday, June 12, 2020, via email to DE Runge at methuen.k12.ma.us, which we read to the public. I will do that. Excuse me while I take a breath to get some oxygen. <clears throat> okay, so we got a couple here. Um, the first one is from Jonathan Becker. 473 Lake Street, Haverhill, Massachusetts. This is Jonathan Becker, president of the Methuen Educators Association. In order to deal with the budget shortfall in these unprecedented times, you requested that all 16 city units take pay raises on rightfully entitled pay raises that were negotiated in good faith. Six out of the seven school units decided to make that sacrifice at their own personal cost, which will affect them for the rest of their lives. Though the program assistants voted not to take the wage freeze, they are among the lowest paid workers in the city already, and a pay freeze could have been devastating. This school committee lauded the teachers on Monday for their commitment and sacrifice for our city and its students, and I thank the school committee for acknowledging our members' sacrifice. In the paper today, a school committee member said they were very, very proud of the school unions, and Dr. Kwong said we were committed to do the right thing. Once again, the teachers and other members of the Methuen School community did what would be best for the students. Taking a pay freeze is an enormous personal concession, one that will be felt for the rest of their lives. At the meeting with all unit leaders, you asked that all 16 units in the city take a pay freeze. We hope the other city unions are willing to make the personal concession as the school community did. We also ask that you join us in fighting for adequate funding and relief as several legislative bills work their way through the federal and state governments. Educators have a lot of work in front of us as we begin to envision what reopening of schools will look like and we shall remain vigilant when the appropriate funding is released. We hope that our efforts are remembered to restore the contract we also tirelessly work for. Thank you. The next one is from Stacy Cashman, 27, excuse me, 26 East Brook Place, Methuen. I have two children, one in third grade and one in seventh grade at Patani Grammar School. Very recently, I became aware that the Title I program money was being redistributed and those teachers will be moved into classrooms to backfill vacant positions. I have a couple of concerns about this action. For one, these children that use Title I services need them and will only continue to fall behind without them. During these unprecedented times, many children have fallen behind and for them to go back to school and not have the help they need to catch up is not fair to these children. This brings me to my second point. Though my children have been fortunate enough not to need to use Title I services, 
They will also suffer due to the money being redirected. As the ones that need services continue to struggle and need extra attention, this will take away from the progress that other students should be making. It is my belief that many parents would feel this way if they're aware of what is really going on. I feel that the changes being made are being misrepresented. Are the parents of the children who receive these services even being notified that they will no longer receive them? How will teachers adjust to having to give the extra attention and also make sure that other students are also progressing as they should? Reading is the gateway to all education. And as such, reading specialists should never be eliminated. And no matter how hard these teachers try, they and the children that need reading specialists are being set up for failure. Thank you for your time. And the third one um, is from Stacy Murray, uh, 5 Bartlett Road. And it begins, I have two daughters, Alexis, seven years old, entering second grade 2021, and Mackenzie, five years old, ending kindergarten 2021. Both girls are students at the Tenney Grammar School. I have a few remarks slash questions that I would like addressed. First and foremost, thank you all for the work that has been done you are continuing to do. Admittedly, I've never been a faithful watcher of the school committee meeting. However, since the pandemic forced closure of our schools, I've watched every meeting. I enjoy being informed and appreciate all the hard work. Second, I am concerned about the future of learning. My seven-year-old thrives in working together with classmates and teachers. Her learning type is a combination of seeing and doing. While there have been videos recorded for her to watch, and I appreciate them wholeheartedly, they're just that, videos. Alexis has taken part of a few Google Meets with her class, however, this is a social time and not used for learning. My hope is if remote learning continues in the fall, the social meets will pivot to formal learning times and they will be longer than 20, 30 minutes. My husband works outside of the home approximately 60 hours a week. My work allows me to work from home a lot. However, I'm on calls, conferences, and the computer a lot. As a parent, I'm in need of more formal instruction by teachers. My daughter longs for it, and she has informed me on many occasions I'm not a teacher. I understand the pandemic continues to be a fluid situation. However, I felt compelled to put, my, put forth my two cents on a remote learning. I've also included this in the community needs survey that was sent out. Third, if the future of learning does involve a hybrid of learning remotely and in person, has anyone thought about what that may look like for families and siblings? I understand why the hybrid scheduling may be needed in the fall, and honestly, I would love to hear that all students would be returning in fall, but I just don't believe it will happen, though I'm hopeful. Formerly, Dr. Kwong had mentioned a rotating schedule as an idea to get all students into school at some point during the week. Will siblings be given priority on the day's attendance? For example, Alexis, second grade, goes to school Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and remotes in on Tuesday and Thursday. Will Mackenzie, kindergarten, have the same schedule? I'm sure you understand the increased difficulty it would pose to families with working parents if they were not on the same schedule. Four, for those not familiar, the neighborhood I live in is unique stretching from pediatric professionals to the state line behind Lowe's. It is a small slice of Sloan, Methuen, excuse me. However, it is comprised of five Denon streets and Rosewood, which is a through street from Hampshire to 28. At our bus stop, Bartlett Road and Melissa Drive is comprised of the following, approximately eight kids in lower school, six in the upper school bus, and six in the high school bus. When talk began about increasing the walkout radius, I quickly became concerned. Unfortunately, our stop is under the one and a half mile proposed walkout. Preliminarily speaking, in order for students to walk to the Tenney, they would have to walk either down Hampshire Road or Rosewood, both roads do not have sidewalk, and then proceed down 28 towards High Street. After reaching 28, students would have to cross over two off ramps from 213, neither with a pedestrian light to stop traffic, and the first with a blind corner, and a third on the ramp from 213 West again with, without a pedestrian light to stop traffic. These intersections make me nervous to cross and I'm an experienced adult who walks daily. I would have a seriously hard time allowing my kids at any age to cross over the 28 to 13 bridge. I would be interested to find out how many accidents occur at the Rosewood 28 intersection and the 213 westbound off ramp to 28 north south as I pass uh, many on a monthly basis. What is the plan for this? Will parents have a say in the public safety observations? Will neighborhoods potentially affected by the increased walkout radius be able to appeal the decision should they not agree? Fifth, I'm concerned about parent pickup lines for those who will be affected by increasing the walkout radius. 
On a good day, the line extends down Pleasant Valley Street while the crossing guard tries his or her best to direct traffic and assist students crossing from the tenny side of Pleasant Valley to the other. The line does their best to stay to the side of the road while waiting to enter the parking lot. However, Pleasant Valley is narrow in that area and inevitably cars not waiting in line are now driving on the opposite side of the road. What if any of the plans to improve the parking lot so that the increased traffic could be handled better? Are there any parking lot improvements or expansions that could take place to better route the line? Will more staff be added to handle the increasing number of students that will be in the parent pickup line and or escorting the kids to their vehicles? I understand with adopting a level budget for FY 2021, ends need to be met. I feel this committee will do their best to find a balance without the balance being at the detriment of the students. Methuen has always been a great community and I, I look forward for it continuing to be so. Thank you for listening and answering any questions that you can. And those are the uh, public participations for this meeting. Okay. Just remember, if you'd like to read a comment at the next uh, school committee meeting, make sure you send your comments to derunge at methuen.k12.ma.us by Wednesday, June 17, 2020, before 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Okay, um, so that takes us to the MOUs. May I have a motion to approve the Unit A Teacher Memorandum of Agreement? So moved. Second. Moved by Member Santos, seconded by Member McLeod. Pash, Member Pash, Vice Chair Pash. Thank you. All right, discussion. No discussion, no hands raised. Okay. Mayor, I have my hand up, sorry. Okay, thank you. Can you see it? I'm on my phone today, so I'm not sure if I did it correctly. This came up, yeah. It is? Okay, just making sure. Just a super quick question for the superintendent, I guess. Um, seeing as though there was an amendment sent to us a few minutes ago that I think will be posted, I just want to make sure that the, for this goes for all of them, I guess, that the ratifications we have in front of us are in fact the ratifications that were voted on and approved by the unions. Yeah, so with the addition of the one that was just sent, the correct and final addition of the teachers union, the rest are correct. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Member McLeod, did you have a question? No. Okay. Any other questions on the Unit A teacher MOA? Okay, Madam Secretary. Ryan DeZoglio? Yes. Karen Halbauer? Yes. Jessica McLeod? Yes. Susan Nicholson? Susan Nicholson? Oh, there you are. <laughs> That's a yes. <laughs> Luann Santos? Yes. Dana Zani Pesh? Yes. Daniel Perry? Yes. Susan Nicholson. <laughs> She's on now. Thank yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Passes unanimously. That moves us on to the Ooh. unit. Ooh. It is a random of agreement. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay. Moved by Member Nicholson, seconded by Member DeZoglio. Got that right on the first try. Um, any discussion? Okay. Seeing no raised hand, Madam Secretary, do your stuff. Ryan DeZaglio? Yes. Karen Halbaum? Yes. Jessica McLeod? Yes. Susan Nicholson? Yes. Lynn Santos? Yes. Dana Zani Pesh? Yes. Daniel Perry? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, moving on. May I have a motion to approve the Unit D Secretary Memorandum of Agreement? So moved. Moved by Member Second. Second by Member Harbauer. Discussion. Questions. This is the quietest I've ever seen you all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Madam Secretary. Ryan Desaglio? Yes. Karen Harbauer? Yes. Jessica McLeod? Yes. Susan Nicholson? Yes. Ryan Santos? Yes. Dana Zani Pesh? Yes. And Daniel Perry? Yes. 
Um, and that takes us on. May I have a motion to approve the cafeteria workers A and B memorandum of agreement? So, so moved. Moved by Member Desaglio, seconded by Member Santos. Any discussion or questions? Okay, Madam Secretary. Brian Desaglio? Yes. Karen Halbauer? Yes. Jessica McLeod? Yes. Susan Nicholson? Yes. Julian Santos? Yes. Dana Zani Pesh? Yes. Daniel Perry? Yes. Unanimous again. All right, moving on. May I have a motion to approve the Custodians Association Memorandum of Agreement? So moved. Second. Nicholson, seconded by Member Desaglio. Any questions or any discussion? Madam Secretary. Brian Desaglio? Yes. Karen Halbauer? Yes. Jessica McLeod? Yes. Susan Nicholson? Yes. Luan Santos? Yes. Dana Zani Pesh? Yes. Dan Neil Perry? Yes. Unanimous again. Moving on, I, may I have a motion to approve the Mass Nurses Association Memorandum of Agreement? So moved. By Member Desaglio. Second. Second. By Member Santos. Questions or discussion? Hearing and seeing none, Madam Secretary. Ryan Desaglio. Ryan. Hang on. Uh, uh, sorry, Ryan. my. my, my um, yes. Karen Halbauer. Yes. Jessica McLeod. Yes. Susan Nicholson. Yes. Luan Santos. Yes. Dana Zani Pesh. Yes. <laughs> and Manuel Perry. Yes. Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, Superintendent, could you start the FY21 proposed budget discussion, please? I'd be happy to. So I just want to direct your attention to the executive summary. I think this goes through all the major points of how we came uh, to the level funded budget. Um, and so the second page of the executive summary is really the, the piece I want to, to at least frame here today with everybody um, and to think about as we move forward in this process of what we did to get to this point, decisions that were made and how those decisions were made. Um, so. The, the most important thing here is that we were um, tasked with the, with the fact that we needed to reduce our budget um, going into FY21 with level services. So carrying over what we had from last year um, would automatically lead to a three, three and a half point uh, million dollar increase with contractual obligations, collective bargaining agreements, uh, out of district tuitions, increase in transportation in and out of district special education and regular education. Um, so without anything new, you know, those are automatic expenses for any school district. And so uh, a few months ago when the mayor and the CAFO and uh, the business manager and I started talking about what, what our budget process was going to look like, um, all advice was coming into us to say to plan for level funding right now um, you know, don't wait uh, because we don't know what it's going to look like when the state comes out with their budget. Uh, you need to get to a place where you know you can manage level funded and then if, if the state budget comes in less, you're, you're going to have to cut more and if it comes in level funded, you're in a good place uh, to, to move on in the school year. So that's exactly what we did and we stuck uh, with that plan for the past two months, which has been very helpful for us in guiding our, our conversations. Um, but the bulleted list just outlines, you know, we, we went through the new staffing request. So we went through the whole budget process from December to February. Um, and we had a fantastic preliminary budget presented to all of you in March, which is I'm holding on to very tight. Um, you know, that is not something that is going to go away because those are, that preliminary budget really does uh, symbolize the needs of this district. Uh, and again, not not expecting that we can get there in any one given year. You know, we, I was looking forward to conversations with this committee over, you know, how can we get there in the next two or three years? And that really was gonna be what I was looking forward to the budget conversations being uh, in March. And that obviously has been put on uh, extreme hold at this point. 
Um, so the first step that we took was going through and looking at any of those new requests. Um, there are some of those requests that do remain in the budget and, and those are there very purposeful, purposely um, and necessary for either enrollment purposes or uh, obligatory services, right? So uh, servicing our uh, special education kids. I don't think we had any new positions in there for L's um, at this time. Um, but those are, the, those are the ones that we looked at closely with the directors and the principals. Um, our second step was then to meet with the principals again and the HR director and the business manager and I, and going through literally every position that we had in the district, uh, any vacancies that we, we were going to uh, incur because of uh, retirements, resignations, non-renewals. Um, and so we did that. And so basically we cut through uh, a lot of those positions and we were able to talk about moves, you know, where was enrollment high and where did we need to fill enrollment gaps? And um, I think that the staffing sheets, the key hopefully was clear and I'll, I'll make sure of that tonight so you know what you're looking at um, for questions as you go uh, deeper in the next few days looking at the budget. Um, that process was incredibly complicated, um, incredibly time consuming, but but incredibly worthwhile because this is the kind of work that I believe has to go into making these decisions and making these things happen. Keeping in mind, and I, I did write it in my executive summary and I, I, I wholeheartedly believe it is the belief of this school committee as well. You know, keeping in mind the conversation about equity and the fact that we do have two schools that, um, you know, we were already concerned about performance and class sizes and you know, prior to all of this happening. So trying to keep that in mind to make sure that we're not offsetting large class sizes in one building or the other. So that's really where my mind was and our minds were when we talked about, you know, moving teachers, you know, eliminating a teacher in a grade in another building and moving them, um, you know, to offset again, classes of 27 and 28, again, at the 10 year Timoney, um, you know, just kind of looking at what that looks like. Um, so that was, I, I would I would emphasize, and I think both the business manager and the personnel, the director of human resources will attest to this, that that was the most difficult part of this process. Um, it was really taking a thoughtful look at the personnel decisions that we were making and any moves that we were making. Um, so we also uh, calculated the any savings that we had uh, through this process, the closure, we had savings in staff, uh, professional salaries, substitutes, you know, things like that, that we didn't have to use for three months. We had uh, significant savings there. We had savings in utilities. Uh, we had savings in stipends. Um, so anywhere we had any kind of savings during this closure, um, all of those funds, uh, as I have said repeatedly, uh, are going into uh, transferring expenses to circuit breakers so that we can build up our circuit breaker account to offset the out of district tuition costs which again, we have talked about um, extensively here. Um, so the, the next bullet really talks about um, what the, the parent comment was. So we also were really forced to look at all of our sources of revenue. And this is something that over the past two years when we had our audit last year, um, you know, because of the uh, home rule per chart, uh, the home rule petition, um, you know, one of the things that came out kind of loud and clear is you know, really take a look at all of your funding sources, all of your grant sources. Are you using those funds to the best and most efficient way you can? Um, so we were forced to look at our Title I um, services. So we had plans in um, January, February, Mar early March to, to look at um, moving from targeted assistance to school-wide uh, school uh, Title I. And the state really is encouraging uh, districts to move in this direction. And the reason they encourage it is because there's a lot more flexibility in how those funds can be spent in a school building. And the whole school building becomes Title I. So you can use funds for professional development for the whole school building. It doesn't have to be just for those few teachers that are paid out of that grant, which is how it has been in this district since I've been here. It's always been targeted assistance. And that means that a certain set of students get the assistance and a certain set of teachers get any, any benefit from the grants. They, they are the ones who get the professional development materials. That's what targeted assistance means. And so we had uh, many conversations about school-wide. We felt that there would be 
Um, we would be able to um, identify at, at this point, all five of our schools are eligible to be identified as Title I. Uh, the Marsh wasn't until this past year. They are now over 40% free and reduced lunch, so they qualify for Title I. Um, and so we were really uh, in the throes at the time of the closure, thinking about what that school-wide model was going to look like and what kind of service delivery we were going to have. Um, and so with, with the budget crisis looming, um, one of the decisions that we did make at this time was to actually, we have seven, we have eight full-time teachers in Title I, and then we have um, tutors, we supplement uh, any other reading uh, support with tutors, uh, and those are not full-time staff members. They work between 15 and 20 hours a week, and, and only at the Tenney and the Timoney up until this point. And so as we were looking at staffing, the only way, because if, if we can all just remember, because I'm saying this publicly again, is that we were, we were tasked with getting to a budget that was going to be level funded with also the, the idea that we weren't going to have layoffs. Right? We, we were trying to do this so that we could have people have jobs, not class sizes of 30 or 35, and be able to go into the summer with, with at least that uh, piece settled. Um, and so we are able to use the Title I funds in a school-wide setting to pay for any salaries because then all teachers and all staff become Title I teachers. And so we did that um, to make sure that we had class sizes. And you can see that on the staff sheet, the average class sizes. Um, we especially looked at elementary school uh, classrooms. Um, there are no elementary school classrooms. I think none over 24 or 25 in the district. Um, and, and we purposely put the Title I teachers in elementary and lower elementary where we could classrooms. Um, so I would say, is it ideal? Absolutely not. Uh, we want our Title I services to be for um, support. It's a, you know, and, and supplemental support. Um, but at the same time, if we didn't do this and I, we didn't use these funds collectively to service more students, um, I would absolutely have had class sizes. I wouldn't have been able to use those funds to offset where we were with actual classroom teachers. And they all have the certification. And I think one of the really positive things that the principals were excited about, and I met myself with the Title I staff a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, um, to talk about this is that um, change is hard, there's no doubt, but the principals were ecstatic to have reading specialists in the early elementary classrooms um, and the, what they could offer our children and what they could offer the team of teachers that they work with. Um, there are not a lot of elementary certified teachers that have a reading, reading certification or degree as well. And so, um, you know, that's a perspective that we're taking as well, that these teachers are now on teams and they have a very different um, approach to reading and a very different specialized approach to reading that we need as well. And so while it's not ideal that we're not going to be pulling out students and giving them supplemental service, so remember that for Title I, students are all in class, Title I students are, are spread out in every classroom and they're taught by their general ed teachers all, all day long. Um, what they do receive is a half an hour of supplemental supports for reading uh, during the intervention block. And so we are losing that. Um, but as we talked about weighing out that loss versus the loss of having 32 kids in a classroom, if I couldn't have these eight teachers supplement classrooms and fill some of these vacancies, um, you know, that for us outweighed. But that's what we weighed for this decision. So I, I definitely... Again, none of this is I, none of what we're doing right now is ideal, right? So, so what we're trying to do is put ourselves in the best position where um, we have a, a pretty even uh, class size amount right now, and we worked very hard to get to that point. I have a couple of concerns, which I will share with you, um, which I'm sure you guys will as well, about some of the classes in this particular budget that I'm hoping over the coming weeks can be rectified. Um, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and then the obviously the most impactful, uh, you know, the second most impact, impactful piece was actually getting the wage freezes across the board. You know, that these are where the large chunks of money 
um, really uh, came from to reduce the budget that we had down to the operating budget level. And so um, we did we did present the early retirement, as you are all aware, because you approved us to do that, um, to Unit A, and the deadline was actually today. And so um, I would say, unfortunately, we've only had one um, confirmed staff member who is going to take us up on it at this point. And so we're going to move forward with that person because we said we would. Uh, it'll still yield a little bit of savings, you know, not as much as we were hoping that this would with six to 10 teachers taking it. Um, I believe Colleen McCarthy had a dozen or so uh, really serious inquiries, but you know, once people started calling MCRS or looking at, you know, sort of outweighing taking this and not taking it, um, decisions at this point were made not to take it. So um, that was another piece. And so I can actually say, I didn't know that yesterday when I was typing this, but I do know that today that, um, it appears we only have one who is absolutely going to take it. Am I incorrect in that, Colleen? You're correct. All right. Thank you. And so um, those are the identified sort of pieces that we did to get to this level funded budget. And again, I would just express none of this was uh, where we all wanted to be. And um, it is a very, you know, one of the things I think we have to keep in mind, and, and even after an approved budget, a lot does shift in a school budget, especially under the professional salaries. Um, just in the day, just between yesterday preparing this and today, I've had one leave request for next year. I'm anticipating other, leave, you know, unpaid leave requests, things like that are going to, they're going to happen. They always do. Um, I potentially will have resignations. Um, so all the things that we would expect to have happened between uh, now and August are going to happen. Um, so this is going to be fluid as well, which we are going to watch in very carefully um, and keep very careful track of because uh, all those things will play into whatever happens and comes down from the state level for the state budget. Um, so that's really the, the bigger pieces of how we came to what we did here in your budget book. Um, you have the budget summaries, and uh, I would certainly, you know, ask if if Mr. Goslin wants to say anything. He certainly can at this point. The the staffing sheets. So I would like to ask if the staffing sheets make sense to all of you. We we Colleen and Ian and I sat for hours to make sure that we had everything in the right place and that the color coding and the key made sense, so that you can really see the movement that was made internally positions that were eliminated, um, the positions that stayed. So there are those, you know, yellow color coded, the, the yellow highlighted, um, those would have been new positions that did stay. Um, so, you know, I would say today, I, I would want to make sure that you all feel that you have what you need to actually sit down and go through this and understand it. And I want to make sure that that's all clear. And I will certainly, any questions people have now, I do anticipate that our June 17th meeting next Wednesday night, which is only going to be the FY21 proposed budget discussion and workshop, um, is where there will probably be more questions because you will have had a little more time than 12 hours to actually look through um, uh, over 100 pages of uh, you know staffing sheets and budget sets. So we got a couple questions, Member Pesh. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you, Superintendent, to you and your team. I know this was a monumental task and I appreciate it. I'm so happy you touched on the class sizes. I know that was a concern of so many parents, myself included. Um, so that's fantastic. And I also just quickly want to thank all the units, again, who made this even possible to put it together because we couldn't have done it without their sacrifice. So um, again, I really appreciate that. Um, my questions, actually, um, Superintendent, you hit it on the nose. My questions kind of revolve the key because I really haven't had a chance to dive into this and just preliminarily looking at it. Um, that's what my questions are revolving around. So I noticed there were some gray highlighted positions and I didn't see anything in the, the key that had um, reference to any gray highlights. Do we know what those are? Yes. And it should have been in the key. Oh, so 
I apologize. So the key that says vacant position, unfortunately, when that was scanned in, that didn't come out as great to all of you. So I okay. apologize. So the, the, the second one under new request should have been grayed, uh, that gray color. Okay, so the any okay. gray is the vacant position. Okay, nope, that, that, that's helpful. Thank you. And then um, the internal moves, I actually really appreciated this, but I think, is it possible maybe to get a list? And the reason being is I was noticed that some of them will say like, you know, grade three going to grade four or whatever, but they don't all say that. So my confusion was in this. If there's an internal move, and it says like grade three going to grade four, and I'm just using that as an example. I don't even know if that's in here really, but yeah. you know, if that is, then are you crossing out the original position as a position that has been reduced? Or are you labeling them both as a move? So I'm, I'm looking at the page you probably saw. So we actually, um, this is what happens, right? Hours we spent looking at this googly eyed, um, cause I don't know how to else to explain it. So when, you, when I'm looking at the, um, the marsh, um, there is the grade four, it says from grade three, from grade five. That really was our notes and should have been deleted to not confuse anybody. So that our final step was, uh, we just wanted people to see that that position was an internal move and then anything gray is appropriately marked as gray as vacant. So anything that happened internally, right, is not considered a vacant vacancy if we filled it. And, and this is why I asked Colleen to come in case I misspeak on this, because it does get googly eyed and-, and what, what about the first position though? With the, like for that example in the marsh, the grade four teacher from grade five, would that grade five position, when I look through here, would that be then gray or would that be labeled as position has been reduced? If, if, yeah. Can I answer? Yes. Um, if, if you look at uh, page two of the marsh, um, where it says, um the pink the pink says grade that's four teacher what's that i said that's exactly the page i'm on right now okay so perfect yeah. if you go down to the grade five section you'll see one mm -hmm. of the positions are strike struck out and left a dollar in it so that's where the staff member was who moved into fourth grade not really what page is the grade, sorry what page is oh right there okay so that's my that's my question then is there a way to break up and i don't want to do more work for you guys because you've done so much maybe even a list i don't expect this like all done over but a list of these positions that have been reduced how many of them were like are, were any of them retirement positions that were vacant we're just getting rid of you, rid of them were any of them teachers that moved to another position and were any of them layoffs? No, so so I'm sorry, yes and no, but so where you see the anything that has been the, the black line struck out, mm -hmm. that means we've eliminated the position. We didn't feel the need for that position and we wanted to move that position to another place to fill a void. Whether it was a vacancy or an enrollment request, those are the only two things we looked at, right? To fill a vacancy where there was num a number issue or potentially an enrollment issue in like, for example, the Timney grade three has an enrollment issue. And so okay. we might have eliminated a position somewhere to fill a position. So there's, and this, and I'll say to you, Jaina and Colleen and Ian were smiling when you said that. Um, we started with a list and then it got, in, it is so incredibly complicated to actually get a list because some were filled by a new position, some were filled by a vacancy, and then those got moved around. So for example, a vacancy might have just been eliminated but moved to another grade level or another building. The, am I making any sense? It's, it gets really complicated to make sure that, and how we do that, Jaina, is to, I'm sorry, member Pesh, is to make sure that the total number of FTEs, so when you look at that column next to that, the projected average class size that says FTEs, right? Those are the things that, Ian built this to make sure that we had it, a formula right, that when we calculated this, if we were eliminating or adding, we're actually looking at the total number of FTEs. And so um, at the marsh, there's going to be a reduction of two FTEs because we, we eliminated those two positions totally. Those people did not get laid off. Nobody, no teachers got laid off, zero. 
So those but unaffiliated, but unaffiliated staff, there were layoffs. The only unaffiliated staff would have been lunch monitors and long-term, anybody who filled a long-term sub position, like a long-term program assistant position or any kind of long-term that wasn't a permanent position. So all those PAs that we see as position been reduced, they're all long-term subs or something like that. So in, so no, so in the, in the staffing packet, if there's anything that is struck out, um, still nobody got laid off. The only thing we reduced were any vacant positions. People who might have resigned, might have retired. Um, that was what I tasked Gina and her team to do and say, listen, you have 12 vacancies. Actually, it was, Colleen, it was 17 vacancies we had for next year in program assistance. So of those 17, where can we move people? How can we reduce that number? And she's eliminated seven I believe at this time and been able to move some people around. So no, no person got laid off. It was looking at how we can make things. That's why I said this is a complicated web of everybody kind of looking at everything together. And she worked for the past two months with her team to say, all right, if we can't fill all of these positions, one-on-ones are a little bit off. We can't really touch a one-on-one, -on -one, right? Because those are in IEPs and those are one-to-one -one service delivery. How can, we, how can we manage if we eliminate one program assistant in a particular program? What do we have to keep in mind to do that? And, and that's what her team has been working on. And sometimes it meant just even proximity of classrooms, so moving some classrooms, um, making sure that students are in an inclusive classroom at a different level so that it's not, they don't necessarily need a program assistant every period. I mean, they, this was a whole reworking of everything that we were trying to do. Um, from the beginning, so no, no staff, um, no staff in a collective bargaining unit got laid off. Okay, so just just to reiterate, right? So other than the cafe monitors, lunch monitors, everybody else was basically repositioned. If that, if they weren't a retirement or an open position for the position that had been reduced, you're correct. Yes. So everybody was. Yes, everybody was has a job. And again, there were some of these internal moves were voluntary. So, so keep that in mind. We, do, we want to make sure that you, you know, there were some moves that said we need to move some folks to fill sixth grade positions. Who wants to go? Because that's how we do it in the contract. And then we move people and then we have openings. Okay, well now we have these final openings. We knew where Title I could go. We knew what positions were open for Title I. Um, and so this is, it was all done in succession to, to follow the contract. Um, and and the, the union officers worked with us the past, I would say, three weeks with all of these conversations with all the staffs that were moved. Internal moves for principals, if a principal wanted to move a staff member within their building, they have a right to do that. They don't, that, that's not an involuntary move, that's a move within their own building. Um, we had maybe a couple, I don't even know if we had many of those, most of them were voluntary. We might have had a couple of involuntary moves and the principals had the right to do that union representation and everything. Um, so yes, anything you see in red was somebody being either voluntarily moving to a grade, people being repurposed to another grade, moving from a building to another building. Um, I will tell you, you can see in the marsh, the marsh teachers that did move, they moved to another building. They actually moved to the CGS to fill in spots at the CGS that were left vacant. So this was, these were all moves that we did over the past two weeks with the, the personnel and with the, the people. So I feel obviously confident talking about it publicly right now, which is what I was hoping to avoid then to allow us to go through that process, which we have done the entire process to today. Perfect, thanks for that clarification. So I don't need any more of a breakdown. I, I'm glad you were able to square that away from me. I think I'm good to uh, review everything now, thank you. Member McLeod, did you still have a question? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, um, thank you, Member Pesh. Many of your questions completely helped me understand um, some of the questions I had. I do have one quick acronym question. Um, the TIP program at the Marsh. Yeah, so the, the TIP program is actually at the Tenney. There shouldn't be a TIP program at the Marsh. The TIP is the Therapeutic Intervention Program, and it's housed at the Tenney. Sorry if I wrote down the wrong school. I know that might have been user error. It's not at the Marsh because it, do, it doesn't exist at the Marsh. But TIP is the Therapeutic Intervention Program, 
and that's the special education program housed at the Tenney. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions? All right, looks like you did a good job there, Superintendent. Outstanding. Yeah, I would like, if, if I could ask the school committee their opinion about something as we move forward with these discussions. Um, one thing we, we, um, we typically don't do any anticipated postings until the budget is approved. Um, because with this, um, we, we are going to have some vacancies that we are going to need to fill. Uh, many special education positions that we will have some vacancies um, I just, I wanted to sort of ask how people felt about the fact that, you know, would, if we could post some of those positions, not new positions, because we can't post any new positions until a, an approved budget is, is uh, passed, but any vacancies that we, we might have, we have some for people who've resigned, some non-renewals. Um, and again, I believe Colleen, most of those are in the special education department. Um, you know, but this, does the school committee feel comfortable if we start posting those on Monday with the line that clearly states, um, you know, contingent upon uh, appropriate funding? I'm for that. I, I think that's very important that we, we stop posting those positions because we might not get those opportunities to have those people come to Methuen. They might get jobs elsewhere. I agree with member DiZaglio on that one as well. Agreed. Yeah, I'm okay. I don't disagree. I guess the one thing I worry about, Superintendent, not to be the, the downer. It, it, so in all fairness to these people we potentially could hire, I think we, the, so we have to explain that if we, if we start hiring people, we have to explain to them that September could bring a different picture, right? right? And that's not unique to Methuen, so I just think that's fair. I don't think it should impact their decision making. Any place that they go is going to be impacted the same way Methuen is. I just we, we ought to tell them, you know, there's the chance that um, you know funding could shift on us, right? And not anything we do. So yeah, absolutely. I, you're, we would never put people in those positions. You know, we have two nursing openings as well. Um, you know, I'm looking at this too as positions that. Even with severe budget cuts, I don't know how we would service the students or the, these particular students or classrooms. I would have to really look at restructuring who I'm going to cut and how, right? And that's, again, going to be a very difficult task when we have to do that. Um, and it wouldn't, you know, these are all the questions that the superintendents have across the state right now is, are we just going unilaterally and cutting every new teacher? Because now you're cutting teachers with that specialized focus with a sub-separate classroom, you know, with our second language chemistry or with our sub-separate anything. So it's really an eye for all of that, but absolutely we would not go into it. We would not guarantee anything for anybody at this point. We just, we kind of want to get our feelers out. It's late, um, you know, I'm not sure, um, you know, just the, the, the temperature out there is is a place where we want to make sure that if we do open and we do get level, we need people in those positions um, and, so again, not any new. So I just want to be clear, nothing new in this budget right now would get posted until after an, an approved, anything that was changed in this, right? But we're just talking about current vacant positions that we anticipate keeping open. Um, the, that's what we're looking at right now. I think we have like five at the high school that is it the, probably the toughest positions for us to find, a special ed at high school level. Yep. All right, so everybody's comfortable with that, pending appropriate funding. That's great, thank you. Any other comments? Oh, we got questions. M Member Hallbauer has a question. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, aside from repositioning the Title I teachers, um, Superintendent, have any programs been eliminated completely? None. Thank you. You're welcome. Member Zazoglio has a question. Yeah, and, and the BBEs will be will have jobs come the fall time, correct? Thank you. Agree? Kept two BBEs in the in this but this budget yeah. yep, consists of two BBEs in every building. Perfect. Thank you. And so all I, just so you all know, so Colleen and and the principals and um, the secretaries are going over. We owe by contract every employee assignment letters by the last day of school as well, and those are assurance letters that they have a job for next year. Um, so we're we're 
and there's there's always a budget appropriation line in there that we have our attorneys you know just make sure that that's the language we need to use um, obviously um, so that's going to be in there so all of our staff uh, that is here is going to get those assurance letters uh, next week and we are following the contract of expectations for what those letters look like for program assistants and teachers Colleen those are the two right Okay, any other comments or questions? Ah, Member McCloud has a question. Thank you. Um, after the executive summary yeah. is um, a budget summary um, in which uh, it sums up the total of each line um, and there seems there will be a $61,000 increase in supplies um, by no means would I expect um, to know how many um, Ticonderoga pencils um, the district intends to be buying, but I would like to know more about that increase, not right now necessarily, but for the bigger conversation, um, I would like to know more about that priority because I see a potential salary there um, as opposed to supply. So I'd like to know more about that. I can, I can answer most of that right now. Um, the vast majority of school supplies are level funded. Uh, there is a couple special ed supplies. We did need a small increase, um, but the vast majority of that money is specifically supplies for cleaning, masks, custodial services, that kind of stuff. So that's what that increase is. It's specifically to the time that we're living in. And do you see some of that being offset with the CARES Act funds? Um, I, I believe it would be a lot larger increase if we didn't have the CARES Act. I see. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And Member McLeod, thank you for bringing that up as well. I will, I will share with you on the 17th. Um, so I guess we'll have two agenda items. I apologize. But we, uh, Dr. McGee, did submit the CARES Act grant today to, to DESE. So we will have that for you on the 17th to share with you. There are some positions in there. So we do need you to approve that. Um, and I know, and I apologize, it was a little bit backwards, but we're in this place and we can always do amendments. So I'm not, you know, if, if for some reason you don't agree with what we're doing, we can always do amendments um, down the road once the grant is approved to reflect any of the changes that we need. Um, but, but Member McLeod, I believe, and Dr. McGee, correct me if I'm wrong, we probably have two to 300,000 at this point earmarked for cleaning supplies and PPE in that grant. Um, that's it, that's it, 250,000, right on the money. So, so yes, it's gonna offset. I, I don't even know right now. So, so Ian and Bruce are sitting on a webinar on Monday. Um, you know, we've been looking at, I mean, vendors are coming out of the woodwork right now um, with PPE stuff. Uh, except even a lot of the people that we call, you can't get it. So this is what we're all up against right now is even, um, you know, the vendors are saying they have it. And then you, you're like, well, we need 7,000 and they don't have it. Or, or, you know, we need whatever it is. Um, so we're all facing that right now. The commissioner is aware of that as well. So um, there is a call, isn't it? A Zoom call, I believe, right, you know, Monday. Yeah just about that kind of equipment for next year. But our CARES Act will supplement a lot of the cleaning costs <clears throat> next year, we believe, um, a lot of the increased potential. So this is all, we had to write this grant not knowing what the guidance is yet, um, but the potential for, and again, knowing that we can uh, do any amendment at any point in time, it's a, it's a, it's a grant, so that there's that opportunity to do the amendment. Um, it was just critical for us to get that in today on time. Um, to be able to obligate funds. So we also put in that grant the, the, um, the 122,000 we, we spent in operating budget for the teacher Chromebooks. We did put that in this grant. So, so in order to obligate those funds for FY20, we had to submit the grant today. We couldn't wait another two weeks to do it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Great, or well, seeing none, uh, thank you, Superintendent, that was good. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Moved by Member Nicholson, seconded by Member Fish. Uh, uh, Madam Secretary, if you'd do the roll.
You are mute. <laughs> Ryan Desaglio? Yes. Karen Hallbauer? Yes. Jessica McLeod? Yes. Susan Nicholson? Yes. Luann Santos? Yes. Dana Zani Pesh? Yes. Daniel Perry? Yes. Great job. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend, everybody. Yeah, Thank too. you. Have a good, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye.